Hey everyone, Azim here. We are in chapter 10. We are going to learn about muscle tissue. So we've wrapped up our skeletal system, but we're moving on to the muscular system, which actually still has a lot to do with the skeletal system, at least when we talk about skeletal muscle. Um, so we'll see what the different types of muscle are, and we'll, we're actually gonna focus mostly on skeletal muscle in this chapter. We'll talk about cardiac muscle more when we get to the heart, and smooth muscle, we just kind of talk about when we see it. So, and we'll see it more in places like the digestive system, respiratory system, things like that. Um, we'll be distinguishing again between those three types. Um, we'll be identifying all the structural elements of muscle. It is very organized and that organization helps it become efficient and strong. And we're gonna see what muscle fibers look like at the cellular level. The term for a muscle cell for a skeletal muscle cell is a muscle fiber. These are very long and thin like a fiber. Uh, and histology will also be very important here too. Uh, in this animation, we can see a lot going on. What's going on here is that you have a neuron that has electricity passing through it. I know we haven't gotten to the nervous system yet, but we'll, we'll get to that. And then that neuron sends a signal and this is the muscle fiber. You're not seeing the whole thing. It's a really, really big thing. It's extending in this direction and in the other direction, and it's bigger around that way. So it's really, really long cylinder. And what muscles do is that they contract. The word contract means to shorten. And you can see that it gets shorter every time it gets signaled to by a neuron. So neurons control muscles and muscles shorten. And by shortening, by contracting, they can pull on things. Muscles can pull. And that's all a muscle really does is that it pulls on something. And by pulling on something, you cause movement, which is the main goal of a muscle. When we look at, let me back up. When we look at microscopically, all these molecules that are grabbing here, if you look at what's going on there, we're going to talk about myosin and actin and how they grab and pull. The grabbing and pulling action is a lot like how rowers grab and pull on the water. We're going to see how these molecules do much of a similar motion to cause movement. To remind you where we are, we're learning about tissues. Muscle is a tissue. We've talked about epithelial tissue. We've talked about connective tissue. Now we're talking about muscle tissue. And the word tissue, to remind you, is a group of cells that work together and they're of a similar origin. Muscle primarily comes from mesoderm. We'll be looking at histology, studying the tissue of muscle, because at the cellular level, tissue level, each cell has a very unique shape, how they're organized is in a very interesting pattern to bring about the movement that it needs to bring about. Um, they all carry out a similar function, muscle does, they're for movement. Um, and there is space in between cells and we'll get to talk about what goes on in terms of signaling between a neuron and a muscle or how certain muscle cells are linked together. We've talked about, once again, epithelial tissue, which covers connective tissue, which connects we haven't gotten to nervous tissue yet. We will talk a little bit about it. About it. So you saw how nervous tissue signals to muscles in order to control them. Um, but we're gonna focus on muscle, how they can cause movement by contracting. And muscle cells tend to be long, depending on the cell, but they're longer than they're wide. So specifically muscle tissue, what's unique about it? Muscle tissue is made of cells that contract, meaning they shorten and they pull. They exert a pull. <clears throat> the cells tend to be elongated. If you take a look at this smooth muscle, a single cell is roughly that shape. If you take a look at a cardiac muscle cell, it's roughly that shape. And then if you look at the skeletal muscle, it actually goes off the page, but that's the rough shape. It's cylindrical and it goes off the page. It's really, really, really long. 
And so as you can see, they're all longer than they are wide. They're all, they're all elongated. And by being longer, they can grab and pull on things. Muscle tissue is excitable. It can contract in response to stimuli. Normally, muscles don't contract for no reason. Something has to tell it to contract. Nervous stimulation is usually what does it. If you get shocked a little bit by electricity or even purposefully, like uh, with ele electrical stimulation for massage therapy, you can cause your muscles to contract. We'll see why that's the case. Muscle is, extensive. Muscle is excitable. Muscles can contract over a range of resting lengths. It's extensible. If you ever play with like one of those extendable pens or maybe like a trombone, when you play a trombone, you can move it a little bit or you can move it long. It can move over several lengths. It's extensible. Our muscles are the same way. We can contract a little bit, a little bit more or all the way. So we can go anywhere in between. It's not just here and then here and that's it. I can contract my muscle here at different lengths. Furthermore, muscles can go back to their original length. They don't just stretch out and stay stretched out. That would be bad. We wouldn't be able to go back to our normal position. Um, muscles are elastic. They can, they can rebound back to their original position. We'll see that smooth muscle is primarily involuntary. We don't control, majority of the time, we don't control our digestion. We don't control our uh, urinary urination process. I mean, we can control when we let it out, but that's a different thing. Um, cardiac muscle, we don't generally control our heart. Uh, it's automatic. We don't have to think about it. So that's also involuntary. The one thing that we can consciously control regularly is skeletal muscle. And even then there are exceptions where we don't control it uh, consciously, where we don't think about controlling it, but it still contracts. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at the three different types. <clears throat> smooth muscle is called smooth because it doesn't have a stripey appearance. I'm gonna skip ahead for a second, we're on slide eight. If you take a look at slide nine, look at the stripiness, I know it's very, faint, but there's a stripiness like this for cardiac muscle. And then there's a stripiness here for a skeletal muscle. There is no such stripiness for smooth muscle. Um, smooth muscle lacks striations. The word for striation, that's just means stripe. We'll talk about what those stripes are, why they're there or why they're not. So smooth muscle does not have those stripes. Um, well, it doesn't have those stripes because there are, are proteins inside of these muscles, contractile proteins, proteins that help these, these fibers, these cells shorten. Um, they're not as organized. I'll give you a pictorial representation of this in a minute, but um, you can get an idea looking down here. These darker lines are representing the contractile proteins and they're not quite organized. They're just kind of spread around and they can kind of crunch together. There will be more organization when we see the ones with striations. Because the proteins are not as organized, you're not generating as much tension, um, and you're getting gentler fluid movement. Less tension, but more range of motion. Uh, the example that I'm giving is kind of like a, a drawstring mesh bag. When you pull it tight, it's not the tightest cinch, but it's pulling over a great distance. Uh, it's overall in involuntary. We can move things gently, uh, fluids and solids through our digestive tracts, respiratory tracts, reproductive tracts, lots of different tracts in our body, different lumens, and also to squeeze out of glands. There's myo, there's muscle that helps squeeze uh, um, fluids out of different glands. If you look at smooth muscle within tissue, you can see the nucleus and the nucleus is elongated because the cell is elongated. So an average looking cell would look something like this and they're all just stacked one another next to each other. 
down here is the histology of the same cells. They've just been teased apart. When you tease apart hair, you can separate the individual strands. Here we're separating the individual smooth muscle strands, the, smooth, the teased smooth muscle fibers. Um, when we look at it in tissue, it often doesn't look like much. So it helps to not only see the smooth linear, similar pattern uh, texture, but also seeing what's around it. Um, it tends to be in deeper layers of the tracts. And yeah, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to it. <clears throat> Cardiac muscle is striated and it's branched. He, let me go back. Smooth muscle was just kind of stacked one, one next to another and they are linked to each other too, but um, not quite in the same way that cardiac muscle is. Cardiac muscle has branches. If I draw a single cardiac muscle fiber, which one should I pick? Roughly this, there's one cardiac muscle cell. It's, it has branches which can branch to other cells, which can branch to other cells. Um, by branching, you're creating this interconnected network of cells that can work rhythmically. Heart muscle is all about rhythm, and you need rhythm when your heart beats because you don't want arrhythmicity that can cause blood to flow in ways that you don't want it to flow. <clears throat> um, so that's the advantage of having branches. The advantage of having striations means proteins are organized, which means you get more power. You want your heart muscle to be strong, cardiac muscle to be strong. Uh, strong enough to pump blood throughout your body. You don't want it to be. You don't want it to be too strong. Uh, if your heart is too strong, stronger than necessary, then that can cause your blood vessels uh, to be damaged because of high blood pressure. So it's this fine balance between having a strong heart to pump blood, but not too strong to damage your blood vessels and cause hypertension and other bad things. The way that these cells are connected, do you see these really dark lines here and here? These are connections between cells. I'm not talking about the really faint lines that are repeating over and over again, but these dark lines that are connecting each of these cardiac muscle fibers. These are intercalated discs, also represented here. They're called intercalated discs. An intercalated disc is a region between two cells, between two cardiac muscle cells, where you can find important junctions, junctions that we first introduced in chapter four. You can find desmosomes. Desmosomes are membrane proteins that strongly link two cells together. It's like a hitch. The example that I gave before, it's like a hitch. If one contracts and pulls and the other is gonna pull with it, it has to do with that rhythmicity. The other thing that you can find here are gap junctions. And gap junctions let things pass from one cell to another within the, within the cytosol. What you're passing are ions. You're getting electrical flow. So you're getting electrical rhythm and physical rhythm. And that'll be really important for the functioning of the heart, getting physical and electrical rhythm. We're going to be talking about that at length in the, in the heart chapter. Skeletal muscle is made of really long fibers, much longer than the other two. Um, if you look at a single uh, muscle fiber. Take a look at bo the bottom right. This is a longitudinal cut of muscle fiber and a single muscle fiber. That's one that I've outlined here. And it's not the whole fiber pictured here. It's going off that way and it's going off that way, up and down in our view. In a cross section, you can, they can just look, they just look like circles or circular-ish things. So in reality, 
these cells are just really, really, really long cylinders. You have muscle fibers that are as long as your brachial region. You have muscle fibers that are as long as your femoral region. Muscles, individual muscle fibers can be very long, skeletal muscle fibers. What's also neat about them is that they have many nuclei. All of these nuclei you see here are part of one cell. They got that way, not because they made more nuclei, but they actually used to be several cells called myoblasts. M-Y-O means muscle. Blast, remember, that's the earlier stage of development for many cells. Um, myoblasts, early in development, merged together. So you would have a cell here, you'd have a cell here, you'd have a cell here, and then they just fuse together to form one really long cell. And so there'd be many, many of these fusing together. Um, and by being really, really long, you have, by having more nuclei, you have more DNA. By having more DNA, you have more protein. And by being really long and having more protein, you can be really strong. Muscle, skeletal muscle is the strongest of the three. Skeletal muscle is the strongest, then cardiac, then smooth. Those striations you can see better in the uh, longitudinal cut. It's these alternating pattern of dark and light lines. It's the arrangement of proteins, and we're going to learn what those proteins are and why that pattern is really important. Uh, in addition to having lots of protein, in addition to having lots of nuclei, they, ha they have lots of mitochondria. Cardiac muscle has lots of mitochondria because those are working nonstop. Skeletal muscle can have lots of mitochondria because they uh, require lots of uh, energy to do all the things that we need to do. And we'll, we'll talk in a later video about the difference between slow twitch and fast twitch. Um, but in general, skeletal muscle has a decent amount of mitochondria for transferring energy. To make your contractile proteins contract, that takes work, that takes energy. And in order to move your body, they have to use tendons to move bones. The skeletal system and skeletal muscles work together. Skeletal muscles are attached to bones through tendons. And if you remember, tendons are made of dense, regular connective tissue. Uh, pictured here uh, is the pattern of proteins. You might not know what I'm representing here. We'll can come back to this. Whoops, come back to this uh, slide later. But <clears throat> pictured here are an arrangement of proteins within, say, a cardiac muscle cell or a skeletal muscle fiber. Notice how we have alternating regions of lighter and darker, lighter and darker, lighter and darker, lighter and darker. That's the striations that we see in cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. Light, dark, light, dark. And over and over and over again. What happens when you contract these muscles? All of these proteins are working together to cause movement towards some midline. That contraction is very, very strong because they're all in a, in a row and they're working together. Striations create really strong force. It doesn't create as much movement because there's a limited amount of space where the proteins can go, but they do work together. So they work together in a very, in a very organized way and it's very strong. So there's a trade-off here. You're getting more strength, but less movement. Compare that with say uh, how the proteins of smooth muscle are organized. This isn't perfectly how it's organized, but it's the best representation I can make. Whoops, so you can see those same proteins here. Um, and then when they contract, you're not getting as much uh, contraction. Or sorry, how do I put this? You're not getting as much strength, you're getting more movement. You're getting a greater range of movement. Less strength because it's less organized greater range of movement. In this table, I just wanted to quickly summarize uh, the different 
muscle types and test your basic knowledge of where, uh, which type of muscle is used in which situation. Uh, pause the video so if you want to play along. We're going to go over the answers of this right now. So we're categorizing which primary muscle type is used for a given function. The first one says, which one is best for generating heat? If you generate heat, that means you're using energy. If you ever felt an engine, an engine uses a lot of energy, it generates lots of heat. Movement and energy usage causes heat production. All of your muscle cells, all cells produce heat. But which one produces the most heat? Uh, that'd be the one that is the biggest and has the most protein and uses the most energy. That's skeletal. Which one pumps blood through circulation? Which one's actually creating the pump? That would be cardiac. The only place you find cardiac muscle is in the heart and the heart is needed for pumping blood. Which is used for pushing fluid and solids along your digestive tract. So if it's any tract, that's smooth muscle. If you're stabilizing your joints, your joints are part of the skeletal system. Um, so you need muscles stabilizing your bones, those would be skeletal muscles. For labor and delivery, um, I'm speaking to the uh, one that you don't have to think about, the one that where it's, you're, you're just, for, I mean, you can force it out yourself, you can push consciously if you're delivering, but your uterus is going to contract and push regardless, even if you don't push. Uh, your uterus is lined with smooth muscle. You don't have to think about doing it, it just does it, thanks to signals coming from your endocrine system and, and brain. <clears throat> For voluntary swallowing, defecation and urination, this word defecation means to, to poop, urination means to pee. Vol voluntary, you can consciously do it, that's skeletal. When we're babies, for instance, though, we don't consciously go to the bathroom. It just happens. Um, that would be involuntary. But we've developed the muscles as we get older to control when we go. For swallowing, though, there, there are reflexes where you automatically swallow. So there is an involuntary swallow. It's still skeletal muscle. Um, for dilating or constricting your blood vessels, Blood vessels are a, are a lumen, it's a pathway. It's not quite a tract like digestive or, or reproductive or respiratory, but it's a lumen space. So the, what's the muscle that lines a lumen? That would be smooth muscle. For involuntary defecation and urina urination, this is where you don't think about it. By example, before, like if when you're a baby, you don't haven't really fully developed your skeletal muscles yet. So if you just go when it, your rectum or your urinary bladder fills up, that would be also smooth muscle. Those are tracts. For secreting from glands, like your mammary glands or pseudoriferous glands, you have muscles surrounding the glands to squeeze it out. You don't have to think about doing it. That's smooth muscle. And breathing. We can consciously control our breathing, but we can also just breathe and hopefully you're breathing right now as you watch this but now you're probably thinking of it because like i'm bringing it up regardless you can breathe voluntarily and involuntarily the main muscle of breathing is the diaphragm and you have other muscles that help you breathe it's actually all skeletal muscle because to breathe you need to move your ribs you need to push down your abdominal pelvic cavity but you're moving your ribs so this is skeletal muscle all right, that's just our introduction to the different muscle types. In the next videos, we'll, we're going to focus on skeletal muscle. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you later.